Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Talk with Sorintan Haure. This special episode is brought to you by Indigenous Hills Network in collaboration with Igran Production. Today we are joined by a very special guest, the Member of Parliament of the Manipur Outer Parliamentary Constituency, Dr. Lorho S. Fose. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for being a part of this show once again. We are glad and honored to have you here on this show. Thank you, Sorintan. It's always been a pleasure to talk to you and you know, disseminate information to my people. And I think uh, this collaboration with the Ikran, the Indigenous uh, Hills Network, and this is one of the first of its kind, and I'm glad that our people are coming up in this uh, particular field, and I wish you all the best in all these ventures. Thank you so much. Let's uh, get, go ahead with our conversation, our short interview. I would like to start with the burning issue of our state. So I'd like to ask you how how would you describe the uh, current state of the Meite Kuki conflicts and the major issues at play? And also, if you can share any insights or perspectives from the affected communities that might shed, shed light on the uh, complexity of this issue. See, Manipur has been a very pleasant, good state insofar as our environment is concerned. But of late, the uh, misunderstandings between the various ethnic communities that live in Manipur has become very, very complex. We thought that uh, this misunderstanding would go away with the, within the first few days or weeks of the conflict. Right. But it had lingered on and I think now the wounds that have been created has become too deep and it is in a very sorry state. And it has caused a lot of problems within the state, the administration and also the 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 communities, the leadership within the communities, I think are becoming very uh, confused as to how the things would go. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, we have not lost hope. Okay. I think the people in general are looking for peace. They want peace to return to our land, and I think that is a good hope. We only want, wish that those who are perpetrating violence, mm -hmm. perpetrating trouble, should come to an understanding, they should know that this is not the solution. They have to stop. They have to stop all this violence. And the people should come to the talking tables. Unless there is a talking term, unless the leadership realize that we must talk together, I think it will be a big, big problem. I think the government is trying hard, they, both this, at the center and also at the state level. They are trying to uh, reach out to the communities. And also the various community leaders are also in various ways trying to reach out to one another. Yes, I know that it is going to be very hard, it's going to be very complex because of the depth of uh, hurt that has been caused by it. There is extreme bitterness, there is extreme suspicion among each other. And I think this slowly, by and by, I think it should be removed. And I have hope that something good will come. The only thing is the government also has to take a stern, decisive step Unless the government is bold, unless the government is decisive, it is going to cause uh, more confusion amongst the people. And I think that is where the government needs to wisely deal and handle each of these communities separately. Right. Great. And do you think this issue might prolong? Or do you think there is a possibility for this issue to be, this conflict to be and at uh, very, very soon or any anytime soon? See, when you look at the nature of the conflict, uh, the conflict started, I think there has been deep down inside within the, their minds for a long time. They have been, uh, you know, bearing all this brunts, all this suspicion, all this hatred has been going on for a very, very long time. Because when the, when the problem actually first started, we could see it, see it burst out. It was like a boom and then suddenly everything happened. It is very, very sad. I do not foresee that this conflict will end very soon. Okay. Not that we want it to go on. However hard we try, I know that it is going to take a long time. We have had similar experiences in the past in the state of Manipur between uh, other communities. And this has lingered on for two, three years, long years. And you know, even after the end of violence, the suspicion, the fear that remains and that they do not want to get and interact with each other very freely. This has continued for a very, very long time. So normally this type of conflict takes a long, long time. I only wish that uh, the sooner we stop, 
the sooner we realize, the sooner we start talking to each other, the better it is. Okay. Thank you. Uh, lastly, re regarding this issue, as an MP, what do you think are the immediate steps which can be taken up by both the government or the two communities involved in this conflict? So in recent times, in fact, yesterday, the day before, uh, there has been community leaderships coming forward to talk to the government. I think this is good, but this should not be a one-sided community. Right. It should be a mixture of various communities. And before those communities come to talk with the government, I think it is important that the communities interact with, with each other. They know each other's issues and problems. They try to understand. And if any solution can be brought by these people, the communities, it is good. But, you know, as I said, the wounds have become too deep. Right. And the division has become very sharp. And so it is really, really going to take a long, long time. But I think we actually need other people from uh, concerned citizens, from other communities also to come in, especially those from Northeast India. You know, there are various other tribal communities, various other communities that live in and around us. And they are also being affected because right. of the violence within the state of Manipur. I think if they come in and then if they try to talk to our people, our people should, you know, with open heart, with open mind, because as I see it now, every community, be it Meiti, be it Kuki, be it Naga, be it, you know, any other community, they are fed up of this violence. Right. They want to do away with it. And so they, there will be definitely some people from within our own communities who will be willing to talk. And I think we must give room for this type of deliberations to go on within our communities. Right. Thank you so much for sharing your concern and insights on this issue. I would like to raise another important issue, uh, which is of the delimitation. So okay. I we would like to know your stance on the del delimitation process in Manipur, especially concerning the Naga and the tribal communities. Also, how do you plan to ensure that the uh, concerns and aspirations of both the Naga and uh, tribal communities are adequately represented and protected uh, during the delimitation process uh, and in the broader political landscape of Manipur? Yeah, delimitation is uh, it's a very complex issue as we actually look at it now. In the earlier times, in the 1970s, when the first delimitation was conducted, it was just conducted on the basis of population, you know, equitable distribution of population, and then they did the delimitation in that manner. And because of which, uh, there are 20 seats that came to the 90% of the land right. coverage, and then 10% 10, 10 of the land within that the population is densely densely populated and because of which there are 40 seats but by and by of course both in the hills and also in the valley the population dynamics have changed and right. so uh, there is a great need over now for over 50 almost 50 years we have not had this delimitation population demography has changed the you know there has been a lot of growth in various places and so we actually hope that something needed to be done in 2008, there was a delimitation that was done. And in certain parts of the uh, hills of Manipur, because of various conflicts, I think uh, uh, that that has not uh, affected Manipur. Right. In the rest of the, the country, it was there. In four states of the Northeast and also Jammu and Kashmir, it was not effective. But in 2008, 2020, the delimitation commission was formed by the union government. And we had hope that those anomalies, whichever had happened during those times, would be corrected by now. But however, they uh, decided that the delimitation will be on the basis of the 2001 uh, population census. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so th there has been conflict. However, whatever it is when a delimitation is being done, we hope that some changes will come and uh, some imbalance would be corrected. So in 2020, uh, we had hoped and we had began to work. We had, uh, you know, intensive consultation with the various communities. And then I, I actually conducted uh, about three months of uh, data collection, intensive uh, consultation and then exercises. It was long and hard, but we had hoped that something is coming. And the, the delimitation commission, they had decided that uh, uh, we had hope for five seats in the hills okay. to be increased, uh, which would ultimately affect the valley uh, constituencies. They would be losing by five seats. But I think because of which, uh, I think they centered the 
then decided that it would be only three for the hills. Okay. So whatever it is, uh, we had hope that if something had happened, it would have been good. And so in my mind, we were trying to work out the, the population in Chandel had increased, in Ukrul right. had increased, in Sanapati has considerably increased. In Churuchanpur and in Tamenglong district, there were uh, some increases, but I think uh, some balancing act within that, that uh, uh, district would have been done by themselves. And so uh, it, the seats that were allocated by the delimitation commission was one for Chandel, mm -hmm. the undivided Chandel, and then one for the uh, Ukrul district, the undivided district, and then another one for undivided uh, Sanapati district. Uh, though we had wished that we had more, but if that was the case, I think uh, if there was one for Chandel and Tegnopal now, and then another one for Ukrul, uh, Ukrul, Chandel has only two MLAs, Ukrul has three. Ukrul would gain by one more, Chandel would gain by one more, and then Sanapati, uh, undivided Sanapati, we have six, so we'll gain by one more, then it will become seven. And then the valley will have uh, from 40, they'll be reduced by three. And so they'll have 37. And so this loss in the valley, I think they, they had a very bad feeling. They didn't want to lose any seat for the valley, mm -hmm. which is why they objected. And there were you know, cases that were being put up against, one, against the government for having not uh, you know, understood the um, sentiments of one community. And so in the Supreme Court, that co case was also going on. And so it became a subjudice. And so later on, the central government, the delimitation commission, this decided that they'll leave aside all the other northeastern states except for Jammu and Kashmir. And so that 2020 commission that became effective only for Jammu and Kashmir and delimitation exercises started. It was only this year that the northeastern states were also considered again. Assam had objected earlier because of the NRC exercises that was going on, which remained unresolved. So it was only last year it, it became clear. And so they decided that they'll take up the limitation in the state of Assam. Uh, whereas in Manipur, because of the uh, you know, uh, court case that was uh, put up by various communities, they decided that uh, if they take up delimitation exercise, it will be subjudice. And so they refused to take it up. The Nagaland government also, because their election was coming, and so they were also not willing before the election, so it was also put aside. Then uh, Arunachal, of course, they had some issues, some problems, and because of which they also didn't take it up. But this time, because of some court case, I think Arunachal, seemingly, they are also going to take up. The Supreme Court had also uh, come down on the Nagaland government also, and I think they may also take it up. But because of the, in Manipur, because of the ongoing case, it became such judice, so it is kept on hold. Okay, all right. Thank you. It's, it's been a very valuable information. Um, there, there are certain rumors saying that um, we, you with the hill people, the people, the tribals are supposed to get uh, five seats. However, reducing it to three seats has been, uh, there has been a hidden agenda and that uh, you are playing a role in that uh, particular agenda. How true is this? How would you like to explain? <laughs> yeah, definitely we, people in the hill, we definitely won five seats. I fought very hard for getting that five seats, but because of the sentiments in the valley and then, you know, when they keep on fighting like this and ultimately we'll get none. And so, you know, we thought that maybe if there is a way that at least we'll get now for three seats for now, and then maybe in the coming year in 2026, another delimitation is general delimitation coming up again. And so we will definitely gain whatever it is in 2026. And so, yes, it is sad that we were unable to, unable to push through to get five seats, but even this three seats, what, whatever we call it, it is also being turned down. Okay. So the, the government has actually put it aside because of the uh, presently, of course, because of the law and order, but more so because of the ongoing case in the court. Okay, okay. thank you so much for clarifying the rumor. All right, I'd like to raise another important uh, issue. Uh, as a Naga, I would like to put this uh, question. In, in your 
uh, capacity as the MP, MP of Naga People's Front and also uh, within the NDA, NDA government. I uh, would like to know if you have raised any uh, questions or concerns related to the indo Naga peace talks uh, in the parliament or within the NDA government. And have you advocated any uh, for policies or me measures aimed at uh, promoting peace and reconcilia reconciliation in the indo Naga peace talk? So if so, uh, what were the key issues you addressed? Well, uh, see, as a member of parliament in the Lok Sabha, we are given very limited time. Okay. Our time allocated is two minutes. And so within that two minutes, I tried to raise uh, once in 2019, okay. then again in 2021, we raised on the Indonaga peace process. Uh, yeah, we, we are concerned about peace in the region, basically because when there is no peace, there is no uh, semblance of development that is coming. And development doesn't come, and particularly in the hills of Manipur, uh, we have suffered much because of this ethnic, um, because of the conflict with the government of India and the, the Naga groups. And so the Naga groups have, you know, come to uh, sign a ceasefire on three terms, and we are happy that the government of India has ceded to that and that they started on the discussion. In 2019, that is the year that we were elected, there has been intensive uh, you know, uh, negotiation going on between the various groups. In 2015, after the signing of the, peace, uh, the framework agreement, we really thought that we see a good hope. Something is definitely coming. And within a short period, we thought that a, an agreement between the government and also the underground groups would be signed and that peace will reign in our region at last. But however, the government also did their daily delaying process, process and the, it had delayed for so long. And so when in 2019, after I came back to the parliament, because my main objective was to be able to find solution for the Naga people. You know, Naga peace, if it doesn't come, it is going to affect all the region in this area. And because of which now they have also said that the Naga uh, NSCN is the mother of all insurgencies. And I think there are very many insurgent groups in the Northeast, particularly even in Manipur. I think there are dozens that are uh, mushrooming up and also in Assam and then also in neighboring uh, other states in Mizoram too, and also in Arunachal. All these things are there and beyond the borders on the Eastern part of uh, in, in the Myanmar side. The, all of these insurgent groups are booming, uh, you know, mushrooming up around the, uh, the Naga people. And so we really hope that insurgency will come to an end when the Naga peace process is signed, a deal is made. But when I raised up this issue, you know, it is during the zero hour, okay. we raise it up. And during this zero hour, uh, we raise matters of grave importance or public importance and we raise it up. As I said, it is only two minutes, so we cannot talk more than what is that time allocated. In, on one instance, when I raised issue, I also, you know, together with this OTIN that uh, in Nagaland, that uh, the gunning down of some innocent civilians right. by the Indian authorities. When that had happened, I had uh, pinpointed and then tried to raise issues in, in, uh, in uh, parity with the Armed Forces Special Power Act also. Okay. And so because of that, there are a lot of atrocities, both on women and also on men, innocent people, and, uh, you know, properties are being damaged and the churches are also being, you know, raised down. And then a lot of uh, uncertainty falls within the communities. And so during that time when I raised things like that, they just turned off my mic. Okay. And so it is, yeah, as we are also considered to be part of the NDA, uh, it is unfortunate that they will not allow that freedom of speech and they'll just want to re put on record whatever the government wants to hear. So once the issue has been noted, they'll just you know, not allow us to elaborate. Mm. And so that is the point. And so in parliament, I have spoken only on two occasions. Okay. But as a member of parliament representing, representing the Naga People's Front, I and that the NPF had supported the government, we have become part of the NDA. And so the NDA would, just before every 
parliament session that we have, we will meet up. And so we meet for two, three hours. And so we are about 14, 15 parties that represent in that NDA meetings. And together with the top bosses of the government, mm. the prime minister would often be there, the home minister would be there, the defense minister would be there, the uh, BJP leader will be there, and leaders from both the houses will be there. So there are about five or six government uh, top, of, top ministers will be there, and then we have all the NDA partners. And so during this time, we always get a chance to be able to speak. Mm -hmm. Whenever my chance comes, I always raise my constantly, almost every time we would say, sir, our people are getting impatient. Our people are becoming, you know, we cannot wait on for this type of uh, this, I mean, uh, peace process to be going on and on. And then we oftentimes have seen that there has been stalemates, uh, stalemates and then many, many months would go without any discussions. And so I would raise these matters in the uh, NDA meetings and then urge them to immediately, you know, come to an understanding and then take up the issue so that we will come to a logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. At one point, the, we have heard in 2019, when uh, Ravi, who was the then interlocutor, he has said that the, it has been successfully concluded, the peace talk has been successfully concluded so I raised the matter to the Prime Minister saying that, see, the interlo Indian interlocutor has said that it has successfully been completed, if it has concluded successfully, whereas the other party has said that it is not. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the interlocutor has claimed is not true because the other party has not uh, accepted it. Right. Now, what I feel is when this has not been accepted, the competencies that the government has been talking with the Naga people mm -hmm. may have come gained a huge mileage, come, come to a, you know, at a certain height. But the fact is that we still have the political issues that have not been settled. Political issues cannot be settled by the interlocutors, the representatives. It has to be dealt at the highest level by the prime minister himself. So I urged him to be able to meet up with the chief negotiator of the Naga people so that they will be able to deal with the political issues at their level. Mm -hmm. And then once the understanding is reached, it will be accepted, accepted by everybody. And then peace will therefore come to our state of Nagaland and Manipur in all, in all Naga areas. And, and then that will in, in turn affect the other communities who are also taking armed groups, all those armed groups also. So we had really hoped, I have been pushing this almost every NDA meeting mm -hmm. and every, uh, even, even the, in the, the floor leaders meeting, which is rep represented by over 50 uh, political parties, they also come and be there. So I used to urge all the political parties to also provide support, to support the Naga people, at the same time support the government when they come forward with some solution so that it will be a consensus a solution that will come into our country. One solution should not cause, be the cause of another problem being created. And so that being so, we have always urged the government of India, and also I have always urged the other political parties to be supportive to the Naga cause. It's heartwarming to, to know that you have been fighting hard for the cause of the Nagas. Uh, in, in a sentence or two, what, how would you like to respond to those people who have been saying that you have not raised the Naga issue enough at the highest level? See, I think uh, that is only, only their own imagination. In fact, uh, I have been raising this issue every time I'm, I get a chance to meet the Prime Minister or the Home Minister. Mm. And then even at the NDA and or the floor leaders meeting, um, well, of course, in the parliament, I had the opportunity of raising it only twice. The reason is I'm, I'm there not only for the Naga peace process, I'm okay. there not only for the Naga community, now I represent the whole of Manipur, the tribals of Manipur, I represent all the other communities. In fact, today I have become the vice chairman of the Northeast MPs Forum, and so I represent the whole region as well. Right. And then parties or uh, other political parties from elsewhere also say that you have to speak for our region also. Right. So, you know, there are various issues conf confronting our nation in, in, in matters of uh, policy formation and then other, other 
issues like that. So I continue to speak other issues also. Right, right. Glad to know. All right, let's, let's uh, go to the growth of our constituency. I uh, would like to know what steps have you taken to improve the infrastructure, the healthcare, the uh, education and employment opportunities in our constituency after you become the MP? And also, um, if you can provide an overview of the key initiatives or projects you have taken up as an MP. Well, an MP, a member of parliament, has got very limited role in the development of uh, a state, physical development of a state. All the issues of uh, infrastructure, all the issues of education, health, and then employment, other things are being dealt with by the state. And so uh, we as policymakers in the, in the center, we also try to do a lot of, you know, pushing it with the central government to formulate uh, employment generation avenues, to also generate, uh, you, know, uh, you know, taking out the higher education institutions that need to be set up in the hills also, and then even uh, medical infrastructures that needs to be created. So we do a lot of pushing it from that level. In fact, during our time, we were very happy that the government of India listened to us, and then they uh, set up one medical college in the hills. Right. It went down to Churchampu. Initially, it was meant to be put up in the aspiration district of Chandel. And then uh, we had really worked hard thinking that it should come there because it is an area that the central government also is emphasizing that the aspiration districts should be given the first opportunity. But unfortunately, because of our own conflict among our own people, mm -hmm. we were unable to provide the, the land that was required. Mm -hmm. And so because of which, uh, it had to go to Churchampur. Nevertheless, I'm happy that it is in Churchampur. They also deserve it. Churchampur is the second largest town in Manipur and the largest amongst the, the tribals. And so I'm happy that it is there. But this time around, because of the conflict, it has really suffered mm -hmm. uh, very uh, badly. However, we hope that with time it will heal again. Now, we have also tried to, the Manipur University, uh, they have decided that they will set up a hill campus in the hills. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I had picked up the uh, proceedings of the uh, Academic Council of the Manipur University. And then with that, I have approached the central government, the Ministry of Education, for many number of times. I've written to the Prime Minister, I've written to the then uh, President of India, uh, Mr. Kovin. And then I had also written to the present uh, President of India. I've written to uh, the tribal ministries, saying that if it could be a tribal university, I have written to the education minister, the then education minister and the present education minister. Together with them, I have pursued after this many number of times. But somehow, uh, I don't know the reason why. And I have also asked the state government also to push. So they have also, in their own ways, they have tried to push also. But I don't know for what reason, but the central government doesn't seem to be very keen in setting up new uh, institutions in the in the state of Manipur, particularly in the hills. Okay. And I think uh, this type of small, small, I will not call it small, but this type of issues of uh, not establishing it for the hill people, that we receive it as a way of neglect mm -hmm. by the center. And these are fomenting, growing in our hearts, and these are, this sense of discontentment grows in, the, in our hearts amongst our young people. I wish that the government is sensitive and they address these issues as immediately as possible. Otherwise, this will, you know, we're looking at uh, insurgency. What is causing in insurgency? Discontentment, mm -hmm. frustration are causing, frust uh, and then also unemployment also comes. Our people are not being educated properly. We are not getting technical educations. Technical educations are some things that we really want to do. I have also tried to push setting up of some industries, mm -hmm. you know, medical devices, Spark, mm -hmm. which is also a huge project. We have tried to do it, but somehow, somewhere, something is not very right. The, either it is the state government that is not responding positively or the central government is trying to put off uh, setting up in the hills. So these are issues that we have been always confronting. And I'm sure we will continue to confront. Nevertheless, we'll continue to fight and push so that at some point, our people will also gain, will become at par with the rest of the country. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, has there been any stumbling block in, in order to implement or in order to materialize the project uh, which you have been pushing for? For example, has the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, been an issue for you or has there been any other external forces or within or outside the uh, state? Has there been any such stumbling blocks which is uh, stopping you or hampering you to materialize the projects which you have been pushing? Yeah, very unfortunately, soon after I came to the parliament, in the second year itself, the pandemic came. Because of the pandemic, the whole of the union government as well also seemingly was paralyzed. And they were concentrating on only att attending to the health issues of the nation. And so because of which, uh, most of the ministries that were not related with health, they, their functions started coming much lesser. Uh, many funds, much funds were being diverted towards management of COVID, uh, management of the health infrastructure at that point of time, which, of course, is a very needful thing that I'm uh, glad that uh, we were able to contain a uh, pandemic uh, within the shortest period of time. And then during that time, of course, vaccinations, which were also developed within indigenous development was there. Normally, vaccination it takes a long, long time. But I think the government of India with all its heart and soul being put into this, and then we were able to develop uh, vaccination within the shortest period of time. Those are some things which has taken a positive turn. Because of uh, the pandemic, the online, you know, classes, online uh, virtual, uh, you know, attendance of uh, officers and virtual working on online uh, e-governance, I should say, has improved. And today we are, the virtual uh, discussions, the Zoom and things like that are no more strange to us. So we are happy that we are able to catch up with some technology. Mm -hmm. But of course, on the infrastructural development side, we have suffered so much. It is only in 2022, early part of 2022, that the government actually started functioning. Okay. They actually started uh, you know, sanctioning issues. And so it was in 2022, early 2022, that I had vigorously worked with various organizations, various institutions, and they're trying to push the government to do something. And then it was only in the early, to, towards the end of 2022, we were able to get a number of sanctions. Mm -hmm. Now, but at the point of implementation, mm -hmm. because of the conflict that has come even to our own state, right. this has really slowed down everything. Mm -hmm. And so it is very, very unfortunate that we have to go through all these hard times. However, I'm hopeful that this conflict will not go on for long. It will end at some point and then whatever we have started, I'm sure it will be picked up and that continuity will be there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, like you have mentioned earlier, as soon as you were elected, the pandemic issue happened. And then after, like you just mentioned, 2022, uh, once you started working properly, another conflict which is in Manipur happens. So it's been more than almost four months now. Five months. Five months, sorry. Yes, five months now. So. These issues kept happening. Has it hampered uh, the objectives which you have put forward? I mean, which you have thought for the people of uh, Manipur, especially the uh, constituency you represent? See, 2022 was the election year for Manipur, right. and so a few months before the elections, uh, the government became sort of because of the uh, code of conduct, we were not able to function well. However we had pushed through with the government of Manipur also. So the government of Manipur also took upon itself to start certain projects. So soon after the new government came, uh, we, uh, the chief minister and myself and together with a few cabinet colleagues with whom we, uh, through which departments we were trying to bring some projects, we were gaining a lot of progress. And so th towards the end, the, after March, from April onwards, we have vigorously worked and then we were to sign four agreements with the government of Manipur. And the, during the first part, of course, we were, documentations were still being done. But in May, we had really hoped to be able to sign certain doc documents. Okay. And so that agreement, unfortunately, because of all this conflict, we were not able to sign. And because all of this were going to be investment from some companies or uh, somewhere else investments were coming. So for those, all those four, we had to, uh, they, they refused. I said, just wait for a few months, mm. will, things will be better in Manipur also. But they said, 
Now with this type of conflict, we cannot foresee, you know, good future in Manipur. And so they decided to move out. So at least in two other projects, I asked them to go towards neighboring Nagaland. Okay. And so I spoke to the Nagaland government and then the Nagaland government, they are willing to take up at least in two, three projects. Okay. So one is the carbon crediting mm -hmm. and one is aviation industry. And then one is on drone. And so these things are, which were initially meant to be first grounded in Manipur, mm -hmm. somehow because of all these issues, right. we had to shift it to our neighboring state. Mm -hmm. However, we will be able to draw services from our neighboring states also, they, because from there will be uh, the closest to them. And so mm -hmm. I hope that in the near future, some things will come to our gain also. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it's uh, unfortunate that so many you know, unforeseen circumstances, unforeseen incidences happens, which which has been uh, disturbing uh, the work which you have been putting for. And then with so many pending projects, uh, I'm sure you are also gearing up for the, uh, yeah. the next 10 years as well. Yes. Right. So uh, I'll, I'll raise a question. I'll ask you a question regarding that. Uh, how do you uh, perceive the political landscape in the uh, ultra parliamentary constituency leading up to the forthcoming parliamentary election next year, uh, considering the presence of uh, other intending candidates? And also there are reports of uh, two, three other Naga candidate, intending candidates as well. So uh, how do you plan to engage uh, with the electorate and ensure their continued support for your candidates, candidacy in the uh, next year's parliamentary uh, assembly election? Well, election is open to all. Right. The field is open to all. Whoever wants to contest, they are free to contest. We, we, we live in a de democratic country. Right. And uh, yeah, but see in Manipur, Though elections are supposedly to be free and fair, and then we hope that it will be free and fair. Uh, unfortunately, because of our ethnic uh, formations, mm. uh, the battle between, let us call it battle, okay. uh, <laughs> between in the Lok Sabha is mainly between two communities. Mm -hmm. And so when sometimes, when it so happens that one community has many number of candidates and then their votes are being divided amongst themselves. The other, the other candidate who doesn't have much, uh, you know, resistance from within their own community, they get elected. And so this has been the case within, with, uh, within Manipur also, in outer Manipur. Uh, a number of times we have with the Nagas, because of our own conflict between right. amongst ourselves, we have lost to other communities. The 2029, uh, they, all the Naga communities, they joined in together and then they gave their solid support to me, for which I'm very, very grateful. And I am only hoping that sense will come to our people also, because, see, there are many issues confronting our people. Post-2024, a lot of things are going to happen. And then this, you have asked about delimitation. Right. Delimitation, the government of India has taken up upon itself that general delimitation will come in 2026. And so once 2026 comes, the next election, you know, those will be impacted by this delimitation. We're only hopeful that our people will also come back to sense. Yes, we have heard of uh, more than two or three Naga candidates right. that are also seeking um, to enter into the fray. They're welcome. I'm happy that uh, there are lots of people who are uh, interested in community affairs mm. to work on for the welfare of our people. The more there are, the better. However, unless we concertedly uh, look at the perspective the, at politics as the Nagas, as a people group, unless we look at it as a people group, you know, the conflict will come amongst ourselves. Mm. And then we will be only the loser. And so once we lose, we lose post delimitation, we will lose for many, many decades to come again. In, 20, in 1976, delimitation happened. Our people were not too wary, not too aware of what was to come. Somebody else did something and then, you know, uh, prior to 76, I think the Nagas had 13 MLA seats, mm -hmm. assembly seats, and then the, the cookies or the non Nagas, they had another four, uh, four six, and then one was for uh, the un unreserved Kampokpi. Right. But by and by, it became 10-10, and then, uh, you know, so when we are not conscious about the limitation, it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I know every community, be it the Kukizo group, 
they're also very aware that this delimitation is coming and so they are also extremely working hard mm -hmm. to be able to capture this 2024. And if Nagas are not wise, if we are not aware of what is coming ahead, I think we will lose out. And that would be very, very unfortunate. And our generations who come after us, we will uh, blame us for many uh, decades or generations to come. Mm -hmm. See, one, one thing I want to say is, one thing I want to say is, uh, I know that each of us, I have been the incumbent. I may not have performed to the satisfaction of everybody. Mm -hmm. I know that many people are discouraged. Many people, because they are looking at the developmental activities, the MP lads, the MP lads we receive is just five crore a year. And compared to the MLA lads, it becomes in 20, 28 assembly constituencies I have to address the problems. Mm -hmm. And in 28 assembly constituencies, MLA lad, cumulatively it comes to 56 crore. And the thing that the MP should be able to do more than the MLAs, and I think which is very unfortunate. Whereas the MP, his basic work is to go and work and fight for the uh, policies framing of this, the country and for the good of our people, uh, which is where I think if we are misunderstood to be uh, agencies for development, it would be very unfortunate. However, as an MP, I have also tried to uh, put my hands on development to a great extent, road development to a great extent, yes. Health sector is one area where we have been able to do so much. And then in, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, in the introduction of 5G technology mm -hmm. with artificial intelligence, AI, 5G, club together, we are doing so much for health. Just the other day, on 29th, we inaugurated a number of projects, right, right. not only for Manipur, but for the whole of Northeast India. All the districts of Manipur are also supposed to get all those, but because of all these ethnic conflicts, uh, some, some districts are being delayed. Mm -hmm. But by November, December, we hope that all the districts will get all the facilities that have been inaugurated on this uh, the other day. Okay. So the other day, Chanapati, Tamenglong, and Churchampur, they have been inaugurated. Mm -hmm. We are looking forward to the inauguration of these projects by November uh, in the other districts also. Okay. So that is it. Uh, we are only hopeful that our people will um, be able to come to their senses right. and work out together. Right, great, great to know. Uh, considering the work you have done so far and also the upcoming or the pending uh, projects you have, how confident are you of getting re-elected? How confident are you to get the support of the electorate? See, I am confident that my party will continue to give me its uh, ticket and uh, I'll go there. And the Naga people, I think uh, they look at our party with great confidence, with great hope. And we are only hoping that uh, through the involvement of our party, the contribution of our party, the people of India have now come to know much about the Naga people. And the Naga struggle for uh, self-determination has also been highlighted on many platforms and the people are very aware. And so we are only hopeful that when we have aware people or when we have intelligent uh, the, in, people in the government machineries, they will come to handle this Naga issues. The, however delicate it is, they will handle it rightly and something will come. And so once that happens, the Naga people will be one of the great contributors for peace in the whole region. We will bring peace to Manipur, we will bring peace to the neighboring states, we will bring peace to Assam all of this region will enjoy. Okay. And so this is my dream. I'm hoping that the, uh, our people will, will also understand. Yes, I cannot go to my people and say, I've done this, that, this. Bragging about my uh, performance is something that I, it is mm -hmm. against my you know, uh, thought process. And so I only wish that uh, people will see uh, only when fruits, when the, we are seeing fruits coming in. Then, yeah. okay. Great. I have one last question for you. Yeah. And uh, when you were mentioning about the party thing, um, there, there are rumors. There are rumors going around saying that uh, you are considering to contest in the upcoming election with a different party, a national party, not the Naga People's Front. So, um, how, do, how true is this? And uh, are, are there any specific policy or ideological reasons that might lead you to choose one party over the another no, no, uh, no, for no. the election? No. See, 
NPF is very dear to me. It's very dear to the Naga people. And I cannot leave a party which our people hold so close to their heart. And I cannot imagine, think of uh, joining another political party, particularly a uh, uh, national party. See, as my experience with working in a small regional party is such that when I go to the parliament, I can speak about the region. I can speak about our people bravely, boldly, without anyone hindering me. But when I joined another national party, say my friend who is from the valley, he used to tell me, Lorho, you are able to speak and do whatever you want. You are the boss of your own party. I, I really envy you sometimes. He says that, see, even if I want to highlight many issues of our uh, people suffering in the valley region, mm -hmm. because my party would say, not now. They always put a break. And so this is something that is very unfortunate. And so even recently when I was trying to raise issues on the Manipur violence, you know, I was stopped just because I happened to be part of the uh, alliance and uh, I was advised not to. My other friend, he was told mm -hmm. not to. Okay. And so like, uh, of course, I, do, I will not like to uh, put up those controversies up again. But I'm saying that having experienced such a thing, mm -hmm. how should I try and think of joining another political party? Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, there are certain political parties which are against our faith. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we will really wish that it doesn't happen. I hope none of our uh, people who have the same faith as I do mm -hmm. go into that political party okay. because it will only destroy. And once you go in there, I know it is very tempting. Uh, many things do happen, but I think that is where I am. Okay. So it's just rumors. It's, you're it is absolutely it rumor. Though. I also heard these rumors. Okay. I said, no, how can they, that be? <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So uh, is, it, is it because these uh, national parties, they invited you to be a part of the party or is it just a hearsay? No, see, very frankly speaking, uh, the way I move around in the parliament, I'm friendly to everybody. And... Uh, most of these uh, leaders from within the national parties, they're also, they also know my capacity. They, they are, uh, you know, they like my nature maybe. Mm -hmm. And then they used to invite me also. Why don't you, well, your small party, what will you do? They used to say. Mm -hmm. But then I, I used to say, I may be small. I may be just one, but I speak the truth. And I will stand by the truth and truth will always prevail. Okay. It is not the might of the BJP government or it is not the might of, you know, any other political party that will win. But it is the truth, I said. Truth will prevail and with truth, I will always stand and I will win. Finally, right. you cannot give me votes. Mm -hmm. My people will give me votes. Mm -hmm. That is what confidence I have. Okay, good to know. All right, so you are contesting with NPF. My sure. party is all behind me. All right. And I will stand and I will always work with okay. the party alone. So how, how confident are you uh, in getting the party tickets of NPF? I'm 100% confident. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're well, glad to know that. Uh, and uh, the reason being there are other intending candidates uh, vying yes. for the party ticket of NPF as well. All right. Uh, just to conclude our interaction, our uh, short interview, uh, just as a closing remark, I'd like to give you a minute or two uh, to relay a few message to the uh, electorate of the auto parliamentary constituency in particular or the Nagas in general? Yes. See, Manipur has gone through tumultuous times, especially this, uh, the current ethnic conflicts between various communities. It is very, very unfortunate. The Nagas have been mature. The Nagas have stood aside. The Nagas have not involved with any community. And this is the maturity of the Naga people and their politics. I would continue to encourage our people to remain resilient, to remain vigilant also, so that we will not be swayed away by hearsay. We have to be uh, there to listen carefully and then to be able to confirm, only then to react, but not irrationally. We have to be very rational in our approach. Our approach towards our communities should be one of peace. We should stretch forward the olive branch that and say, let peace reign in our state, in our community. I will also only wish those, those of my political friends who would wish to contest this election, I would wish you all the best. And, uh, you know, but 
when we are getting into the fray, there are so much of challenges. Let us not be swayed away by emotion. Let us not be swayed away by anger or because of hatred. But let us go forward, fight the battle so that we will turn out good for our people, particularly for the Naga people. We must not be swayed away. And then we will, I will appeal to our Naga, uh, to the Metis also who are in my constituency. We need to live in peace. We need to understand one another better. Uh, when I first started, I, I said, I'll speak the truth. And so when I approached them, I said, I'm a true Naga. Mm -hmm. So many of my Naga friends, they say, why do you do like that? So I said, unless you know me as I am, and I know you as you are, how can we trust each other? And therefore, it is only in knowing each other to the core, your good, your bad, your whatever it is. Unless we know each other, we will not be able to, uh, you know, build up relationship in the truest sense. And so that is what I wish to say, that let us trust God. Let us trust God to lead us to higher grounds. And then we have a God in whom we can always depend. And let us never forget that we must stand by the truth, no matter what. Only truth will prevail. And finally, God will bring us peace. God will bring us victory. We shall overcome any hurdles that come our way. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's been a pleasure interacting with you. And I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Thank you, thank you so, so much, much. Sorin Tan. You thank have been so good. Much. Yeah, thank you. Great host. And uh, thank you so much to all the viewers who have joined us in this special episode, listening to the interaction with our Honorable Member of Parliament, Dr. Lorho S. Fose. Uh, that's it for this episode. See you in the next episode. Thank you all so much once again.